Hello, welcome to ArcGIS Online, Enrich Your Maps with Arcade. My name is Lisa Berry, and I am a senior product engineer here at Esri for the ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World. I specialize a lot with demographic data, but I use Arcade probably on a day-to-day -day basis, and so I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Hi, my name is Paul Barker. I work as a product engineer on the ArcGIS Online team, and welcome to this session. And I'm Ann Fitz. I'm a product engineer on the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. So before we get started, let's just do a quick run through of the agenda. So today we're going to talk about what is Arcade, and then we'll talk about why you actually want to use it. We'll jump into some basics, talk about where you can find Arcade in the new map viewer, and then we'll get a little bit further, like beyond the basics, and talk about some advanced functionality. We'll get into some debugging tips and tricks. And then we'll give you a sneak preview of what's next. And then we'll finish off with some resources. So first, what is Arcade? Arcade is a lightweight expression language for working with your ArcGIS data. And it works across the entire ArcGIS platform, from ArcGIS Pro to ArcGIS Online, and even to run the runtime SDKs and the JavaScript API. So it's a scripting language that takes input values, like values from your data, and uses an arcade expression to manipulate or um, convert, use, do a conversion or something with that data and gives you a resulting value. Arcade is portable. Like I said, expressions work across the entire platform. So if you created a map in ArcGIS Pro that was using an arcade expression, you could view that same map in ArcGIS uh, online and your, your data would look the same. It's secure. Expressions do not compromise security. It's lightweight. Their scripts execute quickly so you get your results very fast. And most importantly, it's geospatial. So we treat geospatial data as first class members because we are Esri and we um, believe that geospatial data shows a lot and tells a big story and deserves to be treated that way. So why should we use Arcade? Um, first of all, it's really easy to get started and you can, you can do on the fly calculations. So even as your data changes, um, like say a value of a field changes, that expression will still evaluate against the new value of the field. So your map will stay up to date. Um, the expressions can be used in downstream applications. So if I created a web map in ArcGIS Online and I wanted to create a custom app in the JavaScript API, that expression would remain. Um, Arcade can be used to add a new field, update a data type, perform calculations, and so much more. So let's take a look at an example, at an example where you might want to use Arcade. So here we have air temperature data, um, where as you can see, the number is kind of long. We don't typically disp display numbers with um, or temperature values with eight decimal places. So you can use Arcade to round this data easily and give it a, a degree label and the um, F for Fahrenheit. Um, so that's just one really simple um, way you can use Arcade, and we'll get into the expression for that in just a little bit. First, before we get into some demos, I just wanted to talk about the profiles in Arcade. So a profile is where Arcade is um, executed um, and where you can use these scripts to modify your data. So this can be done in field calculate, where you can calculate a new field. It can be done in the labeling profile, which I just showed to add temperature labels to your map. It can be done in a pop-up profile um, to add or, or format fields or information in the pop-up. And it can be done in the visualization profile to update your visualization, say you wanted to show a percentage. You can do that calculation for the percentage and then visualize the percent. Um, and then it can also be done in the constraint profile. So those are the profiles. Um, next, I want to talk about built-in functions. So Arcade, the language supports um, many built-in functions that help you 
um, work with your data, work with different geometries, work with dates, etc. Um, and so these you'll find in the Arcade Editor, which I'll show you in just a minute. Um, and to uh, you get this list of functions. And to see more information about the function, you'll click on this little um, icon and it will pull up the documentation. And then if you click on the actual function name itself, it will populate the um, expression editor. So these functions can be really useful, like with the um, temperature data um, that I just showed. That was done using the round um, function which just allows you to round a number to a certain number of decimal places. Um, and the complete function reference, all the documentation is available at this link. Okay, so I've mentioned a lot about this Arcade Expression Editor. So now I'll show you what that, how that actually works. Um, and we'll go through a little, a couple demos about getting started with Arcade. So here's the example with the air temperature data. Now, if I want to modify this label to show a cleaner, rounded value with the degrees Fahrenheit shown, like I did in the, that map earlier, we're just going to go into the labels category. We're going to hit this little code snippet button, and that will open up the Arcade Expression Editor. So here you can see already it's giving us the expression, showing us the um, feature, the temp field. So if I hit this test button, we're going to get the result of one feature with the um, field temp for temperature. So, and then here's the list of built-in functions that I j mentioned a little earlier. So today we're going to want to round this feature. So I'm going to search for the function called round, and I'm going to add that to my um, expression editor. And now we can look, okay, so round takes the value and the number of places that we want to round. And if we don't specify a number of places, the default is zero. So we want it to round to zero places. So I'm going to paste that field um, in. And now let's see what that looks like. So I'm going to hit test. And we can see that this rounded up to 36. Awesome. Um, and I want you to notice that um, once the, I'm performing this calculation and it's automatically returned. So next I'm going to add the, a string to give the label a little more context, the degree sign and the F for Fahrenheit. So now I hit test and you can see that this is the result that we get. So I've hit okay and um, now you can see that the map has updated from that arcade expression. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is this really simple example using the pop-up. Um, so this is a layer of electric power transmission lines. And what we're going to do is we're going to click configure pop-ups. And here you can see it says manage expressions. So this is where you can create your arcade expressions for the pop-up. Um, so first let's take a look at one of these pop-ups. So I'm going to click on a feature. We can see that it's kind of ugly, bulky, in your face. This is just the default pop-up and all of the fields are in all caps. So um, it's kind of just really, really in your face. So let's use Arcade to kind of format that a little nicer um, to, to make it a little more pleasing to the eye. So here I'm gonna click Manage Expressions and I'm gonna click Add Expression. Um, so I'm just gonna delete these comments. And I forgot to mention this last time, but here we have a list of globals. So this shows um, the feature. And if we click this arrow, you can see all the specific fields on the feature. And um, same with the layer, et cetera. So, so that just shows the globals that are provided um, in, your, in, your, um, in the arcade editor. So like clicking on the map, if you had another layer in um, your map then it would show here. So yeah, let's go back to feature. What we want to do is we want to take this um, description field and we want to make it lowercase. And so there's a function actually that will allow us to do that. So here we are back again at this list of functions. There's a lot. It's, it's a lot to sort through. Um, but if you look at the arcade doc, 
um, it really helps get to know all these functions that we um, support. So here's this proper function, and this function um, converts a text value to title case. So and you can do that for either every word or for the first word. So I'm gonna go back to the function list, I'm gonna click on that, and then I'm gonna open up the, the documentation again. So here we're gonna to wanna to add our field, and then here we want, do we want every word to be title case or just the first word? So since this is a description, we just want it to be the first word. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to my globals and I'm going to replace this field or value with this description feature, uh, feature field. Okay, so now I can hit test and we can see that instead of all caps, it's now a little more pleasant um, with mostly lowercase. Okay, so now we can apply that to our pop-up. We'll see, um, then we'll have to go back into this fields list and we can select a field. What we're gonna do is we're gonna remove this description field and we're going to add our expression custom. Oh, I forgot to add the title. So we're gonna add this, ex we're gonna add this expression we just wrote. Um, maybe let's move it up in the um, pop up a bit. So now it's towards the top. You can see it there. But what I should have done is give this a better description. So we'll go back to manage expressions. We'll click on this and we'll update the title. So now we can just say description. And we'll hit save. And now you can see that the title of the expression is right there and the result of the expression is right there. And we can go through and do that and to, to the rest of the pop-up values if we wanted to. Okay, so next we're gonna go and look at this air temperature data again. Um, but here you can see we've rendered it show, using the um, this point symbol with a color visual variable to show red um, where the temperature is higher and blue where the temperature is lower. So what we wanna do now is use Arcade to um, set a rotation on the, on the um, symbol. So first we're gonna go into the style options and we are going to update the symbol style. So we wanna give it the style of something that can be rotated. So I'm gonna go into the symbol pairs category and just give it this up arrow. And I'm gonna update the size a bit to make it a little, bo a little bit bigger. So now that we have this up arrow, we want to scroll down and we can do rotation by attribute. And so we can turn on this and then automatically it's rotated by this default attribute. So we're gonna find this wind origin, which is in degrees, and we're gonna replace that. So now we have these arrows pointing a little more, um, following an actual um, rotation value. So now we're using the geographic rotation. So that's already rotating at 90 degrees. So what we wanna do, since this is the degrees of the wind origin, we wanna add 90 to that to show the direction the wind is traveling. So what we'll do is we'll you hit that um, code button and now we're gonna just go adjust it. We're gonna title this adjusted wind direction. And then we will take the field value for wind direction, we'll add that to our expression, and we're just gonna just simply add 90. So you can see this original value was zero, and now with 90 added, now it's 90. So we'll go ahead and click okay. And now you can see we have the adjusted wind direction um, for the location the arrows are pointing in the map. Awesome, okay, so that's all the demos that I had for today. I'm gonna pass it off to Lisa, who will um, talk to us a little more about where, all the places you can find Arcade in the, in the map viewer and give some more demos. Take it away, Lisa. Thanks, Anne. So there's a lot of different places where you can find Arcade within the map viewer. They're listed here, but I'll just real quick mention how you can find it. You'll either find it explicitly named as expression or in a few places it'll say something like manage expressions or use the word arcade or you can kind of see almost this code like symbol that will help you get there and so you can use arcade like you would use other fields within your data 
So you'll notice all of these places that you see it are all the places where you can work with or use the fields you already have in your data set. So let's go beyond the basics a little bit from what Anne showed us, and let's learn a few more of the details that can help us really create um, evolved arcade statements. The first of which are variables. So variables are uh, a, you know, a Cody type thing, but in reality, these are just a nice placeholder that you can create when you want to work with multiple fields from your data. Uh, you'll see this example simply calls to two different fields from the data and then creates a new variable that calculates something using those uh, variables that were just created. This is not necessary to do this, but it can be a nice thing to use if you have anything that you're updating often or uh, the field might have to be swapped out or, or whatnot. So you'll also notice that last line is a return statement. This is how your expression, this is how you tell your expression, okay, now that I've done my calculations or whatnot, at the end of the day, I want you to return this one thing. Um, and you, again, don't even need to have a return statement in all cases. I'm actually going to show an example of that uh, later, but you'll notice that in Anne's example, she didn't use a return statement. And so it's not necessarily required, but in some cases it is really if you're getting more complicated. Uh, another thing that can really help us do um, some really powerful things in Arcade are logical statements. So these are if something, do something else, or we even have built-in functions that do those same things. So for example, if you have a value in your data set and you want to check if it's over to return high, otherwise return low, uh, you can use this syntax, which uh, is actually built just like JavaScript, uh, or if that looks too complicated for you, there's actually a function called if that does the same thing. If x is greater than 2, return high. Otherwise, return low. If you have more than one conditional statement, you can use the when function, which lets you kind of mix and match different um, logical statements. So if it's greater than 2 and less than 10, it's medium. Uh, if it's less than two, it's low. Otherwise, everything else is high. So when is a nice thing when you have lots of things to handle? So these are just a few little tips that we have. Uh, I'm actually going to go now in, straight into the interface to show you some uh, examples of what I mean when I'm talking about these things. All right, so here we have a map of um, sea surface temperature as recorded by these buoys in the ocean. And right now they're being recorded in Celsius, but um, we'll just say in America, not everybody knows or under, well understands Celsius. And so we might want to adjust this or convert it to Fahrenheit in order to reach our audience a little bit more clearly. And so this is a great example of where Arcade could be useful because at the end of the day, we're not changing anything about this data. We're just converting it. So just like we would use uh, an attribute within our data, we're going to create an expression that will be used just like any other field. So I'm going to go ahead and click expression here. And this will open the expression window as we saw before in Anne's example. And so in this case, I want to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, which as the internet so kindly t reminds us, it is a Celsius value multiplied by nine divided nine over five, and then added uh, to 32. So using that, we can find our sea surface temperature attribute from the globals list, click it to add it straight to our expression, and let's start doing some math. We're gonna multiply this by nine over five, and then we want that entire thing to have 32 added to it. So. This is actually a lot like you would do in Excel, nothing crazy or fancy. Uh, and we can test this to see what it returns. So here we say we see we're getting a number and we get an example uh, of, of what would be returned. Uh, and so this on its own works just fine. But let's go ahead and try using a variable in this case. So let's call it sea surface temperature Fahrenheit. And so if I set this expression or set this variable, and now I click test, you'll notice it doesn't return anything. 
That's because I didn't tell the expression to actually return anything. So if I said sea surface temperature, I want to return that variable I just created. Now it will return that number just like we saw before. So this isn't necessary, but I was just trying to introduce these concepts as something that you can do if you wanted to get more complicated with your expressions. Uh, we can also go a little bit farther if we want to maybe round this number. One of the functions that I think I use the most is in fact the round function, uh, which if we click this little I here, we can go in and actually see exactly what it expects to use this function. It says give it a value and tell it the number of places to round it. So I'm going to go ahead and round this final product and I want it say two decimal points. So if I click test, now you see down here in our results, we're getting two decimal points. A best practice for using expressions is to give our um, expressions nice names, just like we give our fields nice names. It helps it to be easily findable later on, and it also is going to be what appears in your legend. So uh, quick tip, make sure that you give your expressions nice names. And so now, just as we would before, we can go ahead and go in and map these attributes. And you'll notice now our legend is giving us the values in Fahrenheit. So that was a basic example of using variables, um, uh, some functions. Let's go ahead and do some more conditional work using those logical statements that I brought up earlier. In this example, we use Arcade in order to create very conditional labels within this map. And so why would we do something like that? So if you're using American Community Survey data from the U.S. Census Bureau, it samples a certain part of the population. So while we can see the percent of population that has insur health insurance or not, um, survey data such as ACS comes with a certain level of error. Uh, in this case, it's known as the margin of error. And so in order to communicate that not everywhere will have uh, very reliable data, we used labels to communicate this. And if we check out the different label classes that we have configured within our map, we can see what arcade was used in the background to conditionally set each one. You'll notice that medium is yellow, low is red, and this is because we were able to create these unique arcade expressions. Uh, and instead of using a normal field, we went over here and chose that code looking symbol over to the side. And here we have an expression that maybe at first looks complicated, but actually this is a lot like what we did before. We set a variable based on a field from our data from over in the globals. We did that again. And then we actually calculated another variable using those two variables we had just created to determine if the data estimate um, was reliable based off of this equation is actually from the census. Um, and it's essentially saying the margin as a percent of the estimate given a certain level of reliability using the statistics of a z-score or t-score. So in this case, this is the 90% reliability. That's a long-winded way to say we calculated a percent, a fancy percent, and then we're using that fancy percent to say, well, if it's over t between 12 and 40, we're going to call that medium reliability. So these are just thresholds that have been determined by demographers and statisticians as important of whether or not uh, these errors are reliable or not. And so in this case, we just used a basic if statement to tell our arcade statement to return a nice readable phrase. We were then able to go in and give that a custom label style uh, so that it turned yellow. So if we go over and look at this low reliability, let's go ahead and take a look at that expression. Just like the other one, it calculates the um, that fancy percent, and then it says, well, if it's over 40, that's actually pretty low reliability. That means the error is a big percent of the estimate. But you'll notice one extra part of this statement, this final if statement down here. What this does is it uses the isEmpty function, which is another one of my favorites. And what this does is it actually just says, well, if a, if a field or value is empty, it's either null or it's an empty string, 
it will tell you, it's going to give you a Boolean, true or false, if that's empty. So if it's empty, or if the estimate is zero, because we don't want to be dividing by zero, this is a low reliability. And so in this case, we had two different if statements in order to communicate this reliability. So that was an easy way to communicate things conditionally. I'm going to show you one more example over in um, using the when function when we have more uh, conditional statements that we need to use. So here we have bike paths in Sacramento, California. You'll notice we're calling to our bike class field and in the data it represents these as uh, different classes as recognized by the city. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Not super helpful for our map reader, right? Well, without having to even own this data set, we can easily convert this into very readable phrases while not actually changing what the map itself is showing. So how was this done? If we go in and explore this expression, which was already built, we can see this uses the when statement, which as I mentioned before, is when you have um, multiple conditional statements. So we said, okay, if here the bike class is that bike class field. And if it's zero, make it unpaved trail. If it's one, class one bike path, et cetera. And then finally, if uh, handle all other cases with a null. And so this is a nice easy way to clean up your data without actually having to own it or calculate anything new. You're really just doing, again, a nice conversion using some conditional statements. And so with that, uh, I'm actually going to hand it off to Paul, who's going to go even further and show you some more intermediate and advanced techniques of how you can really get um, some powerful techniques out of uh, using Arcade within your web maps. And he's going to show you some incredible stuff. So uh, take it away, Paul. All right. Thanks, Lisa. So we're going to dive into a little bit uh, deeper into Arcade and look at some of the more advanced functionality now that you've got your footing. And so one of the first things um, people jump to when they're starting to do more complex Arcade queries are feature sets. And I makes sense. Um, we're an industry where spatial relationships matter um, and being able to use different geometry functions to query um, and extract information based on spatial relationships adds a lot of value in the maps that uh, you create. <clears throat> For those of you that are unfamiliar, feature sets are really just a way of getting a set of features. So you could do that by a simple attribute query to a layer in your map. You could take the geometry of the feature you've clicked on in the pop-up and intersect that with another layer in, your, layer in your map to get back the features that intersect so maybe you click on a parcel and you want to understand what buildings are in that parcel spatially. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of good use cases there, um, and we'll dive into a few and just talk about some of the considerations and things that you need to keep in mind while writing these. Um, another option that you could. Uh, as you kind of write more and more arcade expressions is that you can build your own functions. So this can be handy at times if you have a consistent set of logic in your arcade expression that you want to reuse and you keep in a centralized place. So you can factor that out into a function and then if you need to make changes or fix errors in it, you can centralize what kind of where you do that. So functions are supported in arcade as well as quite often you'll get objects back uh, from your different functions. So being able to work with, define, and manipulate objects is uh, is pretty attractive. And group by is, is a pretty nice uh, way of summarizing different, uh, different statistics across layers. So being able to intersect a layer, get a feature set, and then group by a given value or category, and then return a series of statistics about that is actually you know, pretty handy. It allows you to kind of summarize information on other layers into one centralized pop-up. And we've got a rich set of uh, data functions to be able to work with and manipulate data. And that's really important as you kind of dive in deeper uh, to have the tools you need to kind of extract the information and get it into a format that you want. So those are some of the concepts we're going to touch on really quickly today. Um, we don't have a ton of time, so I'll try and be quick. But 
I just want to touch on a few things ahead of time. So, especially if you're new, um, arcade can be a little intimidating. I think once you dive in, once you've seen a few concrete examples, uh, I think it, it becomes a very approachable language. We've tried to model it off after familiar patterns like Excel and JavaScript and things that most users have had some exposure to. So, but when you're sitting down to plan a arcade exp expression, particularly one that's a little more complex than maybe just adding a few attributes together, I really encourage you to plan things out ahead of time. Make some notes on paper or just in a notepad or something like that. Think about what you want to do and maybe some of the problems that you need to think through. Do I need to handle null values? Do I have that condition? Um, how do I want to express that data? Are there any gotchas about the data set where I need to manipulate the data um, while I'm pulling it out in my arcade expression? So inside of the arcade editor, we've got a test button and I encourage you guys to take advantage of it. Um, the test button allows you to change some of the values, attribute values for dollar feature. And what that will allow you to do at times, um, it won't solve everything, but it'll, it'll allow you to adjust the values that you're testing within the arcade editor. And then you can use that to help ensure that you're hitting different conditional logic blocks in your code and making sure everything's, are, everything's working correctly. So um, I touched on this before, but if you're writing longer expressions and there's repeat logic, factor some of that stuff out into functions. It'll make it more readable. Uh, it'll be easier to debug and troubleshoot. And right now, and I'm happy to announce we're trying to resolve and expand on this, um, you can log information out to the console. So that can be handy if you're trying to figure out what the value of a given variable is um, or why something isn't working. You can log some information out to the console in the absence of a full-blown debugger. And I'll touch on that towards the end. Uh, and feature sets are very empowering. Uh, you can do a lot of really interesting, complex things. And I think most of you, uh, if not all of you, understand that the more complex you make sp spatial operations, the longer uh, they take to execute. And there's no magic here either. I mean, if anything, that you need to be more considerate of this than, say, in your traditional desktop software. Um, so pay attention to how the performance of your data. Test it uh, in kind of your best condition or your wor and your worst condition. And if you can, combine multiple expressions together into a single expression when you can. So maybe you have to do a few different operations. If you can do that all in one expression, there's an opportunity there potentially to reduce the number of queries that the, need to be sent to the server, and you're gonna be able to get better performance when that happens. And so if you're ever curious about how many queries you're sending um, with an arcade expression, you can quickly open the Chrome debugger uh, and see that and see how many queries are firing. Um, I think at times it would probably surprise you how many get, get fired off to answer the question that you've asked in your arcade expression. So just keep that in mind and uh, take that under consideration when, when planning ahead. So without further ado, I'm gonna dive into a quick feature set demo or two, and then we'll talk about what's next. Uh, let me just hop over here. All right. So I've got a pretty straightforward data set here. Uh, we're going to go with the tree theme this UC release. Uh, urban trees are a nice data set because um, everyone, I think, understands trees. So I've got trees. They're colored by height. That's not super important right now. But if I click on a single tree, it's going to go out. It's going to pull in some information. And you can see that I've summarized a whole bunch of different information up at the top here. I'm actually using some charts to summarize some additional information. And then there's kind of the boring nitty gritty overhead information in the, uh, in the pop up, just about each individual tree. I'm going to focus on the charts here. So I'm going to click on the layer to select and let's dive into the pop up for just a quick minute. And I apologize for the cramped screen real estate. We're recording on fixed resolutions to make streaming more stable for you guys. So uh, let's just dive in. So this is an interesting one. It's not complicated and I want to stress that. So, um, but let's walk through it together. So this is actually taking the average uh, surrounding tree height for the neighbors of the tree, basically. So when you click on a tree, it's going out and it's actually 
buffering the active feature that you clicked on 100 feet, and it's going to intersect the tree layer, so its own layer, with that um, <coughs> with that buffer, and then return the average height of the trees and round it to two decimal places. And so what that allows us to do, we've got another one here that does the same with the diameter, and what that does allows us to do in the pop-up is actually do a neat little comparison here where I'm looking at the surrounding trees in relation to the tree that I've clicked on. So you can see that the average surrounding tree is actually quite a bit smaller than this, this one um, on the diameter, actually. So let's go to the height. Um, so if I look at the height of this tree, it's still, still reasonably taller than the surrounding tree height. So really simple, three lines of arcade I've actually gone out and queried. Uh, a layer, I've actually, sorry, let me, I've buffered a layer, I've intersected that uh, with the tree layer, and I've just summarized some very quick statistics uh, based on that spatial relationship. So allows for an effective comparison. And in keeping with the tree theme, I'm going to show a few examples with uh, group by. So I'm going to click on the Toronto neighborhood here. And this is an example of one that's actually a little slow. And I wanted to use this just to point that out. This is this is a little heavy, right? We don't, um, because of the data and because of the size of the data, this one can be extremely slow. Um, so you see it took a really long time there. Um, and that's because there are a whole lot of trees in downtown Toronto. So you see that we, there's a, it's just a straightforward string of text, but we've got a lot of information here. So I've got 3,218 trees in the neighborhood of Brookhaven. There are 149 unique tree species, and the most popular tree species in the neighborhood is a Norway maple. And let's look at how we kind of got to that answer. So, do, do, do. so. This one's a little more involved, but it still starts with a kind of similar pattern. We're going to keep in mind we're clicking on the neighborhood polygon. When the user clicks on it, we're going to intersect the neighborhood with our urban forestry layer, okay? This may not look as intuitive, but this is just to handle a null case and I wanted to call it out. So what I'm actually doing is I'm getting the first feature in the feature set above. And what I'm doing is just doing a really quick test to make sure that the feature set actually contains at least one feature. In Arcade, you are responsible for handling your nulls. So this is a way you could do it. So uh, default value is a neat one because default value will return uh, the, basically the first parameter when it's, when it's not empty or null, and then you can define what you want to return in the case that it's actually null. So in this case, I'm going to return a string that says no trees if it's empty, and then what I'm doing here is I'm actually saying, okay, if it's null, uh, or sorry, is it null equals no trees, then we return a string that says, hey, there's no trees in this neighborhood. Otherwise, we do all the interesting stuff. So the first thing I'm doing here is getting a distinct, using distinct. A distinct's going to actually look at all of the values for this field common name and return a distinct list. So all the unique trees along with their count, actually. So, um, and then I'm also getting a total list of trees and then for that total tree count. And then I'm also grouping by. So this is where, uh, all right. So <clears throat> I'm getting the count to get the total counts of the trees. And then I'm going to group all of them by tree species. And because I want to know how much, how, how many, trees are there for each species because I want to return the, uh, the total, I can, uh, I can add in the count statistics. So group by is a little, little weird to kind of figure out at times, but I think once you get the hang of it is, um, in the simple case, you're passing the field name as an expression and then the statistics count and you're giving the out field a name. In this case, I've called it count. And then what I'm doing here is I'm, uh, Taking, I'm first ordering that group by query uh, by count in descending order, so that the the most popular tree is at the top, and then I'm just cherry picking the first one off the off this stack of that group by and feeding it in. So 
<clears throat> and then I'm returning it. And then I'm using a template literal and building my string. And that's what we see here. So <clears throat> a lot of little things going on, but at the end of the day, uh, it creates a nice summary pop-up. And I could have used something like proper that we saw earlier to kind of make this not all caps and shouty, um, but I didn't. So I'm running out of time. I'm gonna try and speed things up, but I really wanna show you what's next. So the big, big thing we're working on right now is a complete overhaul of the arcade editor. Uh, and the goal here is to make it modern, make it feel like an actual IDE and give you the options that really let you move fast and save you time. So some of the other functions we're, ha we're doing, uh, we're bringing in, introducing more internationalization options. So being able to you know, explicitly define a locale for your data set um, when you're returning things in, in Arcade. Um, for attachments, we're gonna try to give you ex access to the EXIF information so that you can actually pull out attachment metadata. Um, we're adding in 3D length and we're continuing to push and drive more functionality around pop-ups and giving you more options. So really, really quickly, I'm gonna do a 30 second uh, demo of the new Arcade Editor. This is just running locally in a window, so bear with me and it's hot off the press. But the idea here is that this is the new window. The code shines, we've got lots of screen real estate here. Um, we're going to make it easier to kind of insert and find things. So um, on the right hand side, or maybe the left by the time it's done, we've got the ability to kind of browse and auto insert similar to what we have today. We're gonna to take a really layer centric approach, I think for doing some of the feature sets. Um, and so you can actually more like, yes, more akin to browsing the content of your map versus browsing layers through the global variables. So we're, um, we're gonna to attempt to kind of make that a little more approachable because we recognize some folks are, you know, when you're, especially when you're first getting started, that can be a little confusing. And sometimes you just want to find your layer. So, but that's not where the cool stuff is. So we've actually taken this code editor, which is for everyone's own benefit is Monaco, which is Microsoft's uh, uh, product. Uh, and it's what powers Visual Studio Code. And we've been teaching it to understand Arcade. And the net result of that is that we get some really cool uh, autocomplete and telesense along the way. So I can actually do something like this where I say var x. And you'll see that it's actually telling me that x is defined but not used. This isn't an error, but this is a warning. Um, so we're actually building in a mix of errors to help you and give you the right information to know what's wrong, but also building in some error warnings along the way. So you could also actually do something like this. And these are nice snippets. So I can actually hit that and auto completes and inserts that for me. And if I did something like var x, it's gonna warn me down here too. It's gonna to say, you define this twice. It's technically okay, but this is not cool. Um, and it's probably gonna cause you problems later. So um, yeah, so we've been, that's kind of, there's gonna be a mix of kind of auto complete for structures as well as finding information about your function. So if I type in angle, you'll see that it auto inserts You'll see the nice highlighting. It takes me to the first parameter and I could say dollar feature and then tab takes me to the second one. So allows you to move quickly. So let me just bring up intersects. Same thing for all of these. So we're doing a lot of work here to kind of help you uh, find what you're looking for faster without having to leave the coding window and helping you move faster once you do. And it's not shown over here, but we actually are, are, we have a pretty lofty goal of being able to do actual debugging. So being able to insert breakpoints, being able to traverse the code, inspect variables along the way, including things like feature sets. And we think that, you know, as you write more complex expressions, that's going to be essential for, you know, allowing you to move quickly and confidently while uh, writing Arcade. I'll just flip over to quickly to our resource page. Um, Here's a quick resource page, um, lots of good stuff here. If you take a screenshot of anything, this is the one to do it. Um, and thank you very much for attending and please take the time to find us at the islands and uh, ask questions, happy to answer them and uh, enjoy the rest of the UC, thanks.